I told him it was that play. He said, I think it's a play. Okay, Dr. Oh, that you're wrong. That is, that is wonderful. I told him I think it's a play. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. I didn't know how to get I didn't know how to get it. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to a new week. Do we have any future teachers in here? Yeah. Can I please plead with you in the future, if you are ever teaching in a room that has whiteboards, okay, and you happen to have these uh, these things, this is supposed to be like a disinfectant or something, hand wipes or whatever. Do not use these on your whiteboard. I came in here this morning and I could not even write on this board. It reminded me of when it was COVID uh, time and I was teaching out of my garage in Colorado where it was like 40 degrees in my garage. And if it's that cold, you can't erase anything. Uh, I had to go buy a space heater and just pour hot air onto my board while I was teaching my classes during COVID uh, because I could not erase the board was that cold. And this is reminding me of that. It's not that cold in here, but I couldn't erase the board because, and you can still see it didn't erase perfectly, um, that somebody has been using this. This, In fact, I'm going to take this down to my office. <laughs> Nobody's going to use that anymore uh, because they're messing up this board, which is really annoying. So that's just a Pro tip for the future. Um, anyway, other than that, and other than the fact that there was a fire drill this morning that I lost 40 minutes of class time for, uh, I'm just doing great today. Um, I'm having a really, really great day. It's been one of those days. Um, no, I, I, all I, all I could do is uh, smile and shake it off. Um, let's see. I have a couple of announcements here. Uh, first one is, uh, oh, guess what? They're going to do the fire drill again right after this class. So, run. so instead of going straight to my office hours downstairs, I'm going to be going out to the fountain. Uh, you know, basically when the fire drill goes off, I don't think it'll happen until actually 530. When the fire drill goes off, uh, don't use the elevators. If you're still in the building, uh, use the stairs to go outside and there, there'll be people out there with orange vests on telling you where to go uh, hang out. I'll be hanging out by the fountain, uh, by the front of the campus with the orange trees. So if you don't wanna wait until like six, I'm guessing it'll be about six o'clock when I can finally come back inside again. Um, if you don't wanna wait till that time to talk to me, uh, just come on and hang out outside with me. for It'll be dark, we can just, stand in the dark and talk about graph theory. Uh, it sounds like, sounds like a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so that's the first announcement. There is homework due tonight, um, and I will be having all of my office hours just kind of partially outside and partially inside. Um, and I'd be glad to help you out with, with any of that. Uh, what other things do I need to mention? So we have, we have the homework, uh, so I think it's number 10, uh, due tonight. Um, I've been giving people some hints on some of that, and I'm happy to, if some of the rest of you need some hints as well, feel free to ask me. On Thursday, uh, just two days from right now, we are going to take a quiz. Um, so this is our second quiz only, probably might, might be the only other quiz we have. Um, quiz number two, this is going to cover kind of what we've done since the first exam. So just so everybody can... Uh, be on board with this, this would be 7.1, 7.2, 7.4, and 7.5. That's the material on recurrence relations. And then we've started chapter 11, and we're actually pretty well finished with chapter 11 now, the, the five sections that we've kind of looked at. Again, only the stuff we've actually done in class. I know there's the book kind of goes off on a tangents a fair amount. Um, so you can expect 20, 20, maybe 25 minutes to work on this quiz uh, with kind of somehow kind of an equal balance between uh, a recurrence relation and a graph theory type of focus. And it'll just be on one sheet of paper. So I'm gonna make sure that it's not uh, gonna take more space than that. Um, just counts the same as a homework. So it's nothing to get super stressed out about. Um, if you're looking after you're done with tonight's homework, if you're looking for like, well, how should I study for this thing or what should I do? You obviously could go back to the homeworks, um, which would be 
uh, homework. There's actually a fair number of them we've done, including tonight, so there'll be 10 homeworks. I am going to try to grade your homeworks by tomorrow and also post the solutions, so we should have all of that done. Also, there have been a couple of group works, uh, number 8 through 10, I believe, would be the group works that are relevant. So you could look at those. Um, the purpose of the quiz is sort of, uh, you know, we're about a week and a half out from our exam now. We have a midterm coming up not too far down the road. And I thought this might be good to just take a little bit of a breather from the homework and sort of review the material up until now to kind of set ourselves up for that. I'm pulling up our Canvas page over here to just show you what I've been doing to kind of get ready for next week. Um, in the files section of our Canvas page, there is a midterm two resources folder. Let me just uh, go through this with you uh, briefly. Um, it's pretty similar to what we did for the first exam, so I don't need to probably say a lot about it. I've got a couple of sample midterms down here. One of them is in all caps and the other one is in all lowercase. So you could start looking at that. Keep in mind that um, we haven't quite covered all of the material yet for the exam, although we're close. We're actually pretty close as soon as we finish this stuff from uh, uh, this uh, stuff about planar graphs will be pretty much there. So you might, if you look at the sample exams, you might run into a question about planar graphs or planar representations. That will not be on the quiz for this Thursday. Um, there's also um, a review session with some questions and also answers to those questions. Um, now, guys, I hope you won't be too upset with me. I have actually decided to not actually do a review session this time in person. Uh, this is a very busy week for me. I'm just going to have a hard time doing it. But what I do have is a two and a half hour video of this same review session from last year. So can I just la let you do that? So if we go to the pages section in Canvas, I actually rewatched the video, if you can believe it, and I stayed awake for two and a half hours. <laughs> to just double check that, okay, this is a good review to use. So if you click on this thing here, this is um, a YouTube link that has about two and a half hours of me solving those problems that are in the review session document. Um, quick uh, comment about that is that I didn't necessarily always solve them directly in order. So if you were like looking for a specific problem, you might have to like scroll around a little bit <laughs> to try to find it. But I think I went through most of that review packet during that review session. So I think and I think at least for this time around, I'm just going to do do it this way. I'm pretty happy with that review, how it came out. Um, and I think it should be as good as anything I could do any other way. For the final, I'm planning, I will definitely try to come back and just be doing a live session as well. But for right now, I'm going to just stick with that video. I think it'll be good enough uh, for you guys. Um, and then also there is a review packet here, midterm two review up here at the top. So I'm just going to open this for a second. Um, if you go down to the bottom of it, you'll see there's a whole bunch more sample problems. <laughs> so if the uh, sample exams and if the review session and all the group work and all the homework, if all of that is not enough, <laughs> well, then there's even more problems down here that you could look at. And I have the solutions to all of these um, posted as well in that same folder. Okay, so you have everything is solved there. I just want to pull up to the top of this for a second. Um, remember that our exam is, um, that's not the right date. Um, I need to fix that date. This is Thursday the 21st. I think I fixed it on my computer and did not upload this correctly. So yeah, that needs to be that needs to be fixed. It's on Thursday the 21st. And you can see what sections are being covered, chapter seven, chapter 11, and then this one section about planar graphs that we're covering right now. And as I said, for the review session, uh, please just check in the pages section of Canvas for that. Um, what I wanted to say is my extra office hours, because I always like to try to have extra office hours before the exam. Um, I I think I told you already I'm going to be gone next week. So we will not have class on Tuesday next week. I'm just going to give you a free day to just study and just uh, kind of get yourself prepared for Thursday's exam. Um, at least through Saturday, I am okay with having in-person office hours. So on Friday and Saturday, I'm still going to be in town. So you can come either in person or in Zoom uh, Friday evening or Saturday 4.30 to 7, that kind of time frame. 
Uh, starting on Sunday, however, I'm going to be doing only Zoom office hours. And this is a little bit tentative. So I'm actually going to be three hours time zone difference. <laughs> so my uh, office hours running until midnight isn't going to work for me because that would be three o'clock in the morning where I'm going to be. So I'm shifting these a little bit earlier. You might notice uh, Sunday afternoon on the early side. Same thing of Monday. Well, I tried to do Tuesday during our class because I figure everybody's free at that time to ask me some questions. So I put those times in there. Um, I'm going to be able to communicate with you guys. You can email me questions if you prefer. You can, of course, come into these Zoom hours. If I need to change anything, I will be emailing you. Like if I, I mean, I'm not 100% sure what I'm getting myself into. I'm actually going out of the country, if you believe it. So that's going to be a little bit of the tricky part of this. Okay. So just wanted to let you know about that. The rest of this is a, you know, a pretty good just review about the, uh, the main topics, right? Uh, what you're going to be expected to know from uh, these important theorems here. Um, you know, so there's a whole long list. We've kind of gone through most all of this by now um, for the most part. Um, so you can just use this as a checklist to kind of prepare yourself a little bit um, and kind of uh, go from there. Okay, things to be able to do. Uh, that's another thing. Um, Group works eight through 11. So for the quiz, I would say eight through 10, but then there's an 11th one that we're gonna do this week. Uh, and I think that should be a pretty good uh, preparation. Does anybody have any questions, Christian? Yeah, so we still have homework 11 due next week. Yes, that is due on Tuesday. So let me um, remind you, yeah. on Tuesday, there is another homework to do. Is there any way to push that? The problem, the problem is the exam is going to cover that stuff. So if I push the homework back, then when are you going to do it after the exam? I don't want to learn it. You have to know. Well, you have to know it for the midterm. That's the problem. That's the problem. So I would rather not do that. I mean, the only thing I could do if there was a huge revolt about it is I could just say it won't count, and here's the homework, and you can just. I would just post the solutions and you would just study it. But I would not, I would not be doing it in the format of doing it after the exam. That does not make sense to me. Um, let me take another look at that assignment. Uh, if I, I mean, if I feel like it's too much, maybe I can either shorten it or cancel it altogether. I'm hesitant to do that because a lot of times when I don't require something, um, I'm worried that some people, not you, but you know, some people might decide that, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. But actually, you should worry about it for this exam. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, it's <laughs> Yes, yes, that's 7.2. Okay. Yeah, that's that's definitely something to take a, a peek at. Uh, Nikolai, and then let's... Nikolai. I'm not going to be able to cover everything on the quiz, so it would probably be two to three questions, something like that. I have not written the quiz yet, so yeah. Let's see. I'm sorry? Recurrence related? Oh, setting up the recurrence relations? Yeah, that's mostly in the very beginning in 7.1. And then 7.4 is solving the homogeneous recurrence relations. 7.5 is solving the non-homogeneous recurrence relations. Yeah, so that's kind of how chapter seven broke down. It kind of sounds like one problem. It could be a lot, yeah. So I'll have to make it pretty reasonable. Um, yeah. Just for my I remember we had a discussion about if the of X term was one, whether we use the polynomial or the exponential form for the non-homogeneous term. Which one did you say we um, so if, if it was a constant term right. added to the end of it, um, because a constant term fits both forms is sort of a polynomial and it's a, an exponential function. I believe that they both should work. Did we discuss this? I don't remember. Uh, so they, they should both work. Um, which one would be easier? 
Actually, it shouldn't really make a difference. It should be equally easy because if it was a constant term, then the, the, the form of the polynomial that you use would just be a constant polynomial. Right. That's just one parameter. And if it was if you viewed it as an exponential function, then, um, well, it would just be P times, right. you know, one to the N, and then there's just one constant in that case as well. So I think it's kind of, I think the two cases actually kind of coalesce in that case. Yeah. Just try to view the quiz as um, initial study for the exam. I, I want you to think of it that way. Um, don't worry so much about starting the next homework between now and Thursday. Focus instead on this is my early reviewing for the midterm. And just know that this does not count that much of your grade. Right? We've had quite a number of homeworks, so one quiz isn't going to make a, a massive difference one way or the other. Okay. Um, is that okay with everybody? So I, I will take another look at the homework, uh, try to be reasonable with it, but I, I am going to not necessarily cancel it, uh, but I'll take another look at it, see what I can do. Okay. Any other questions, Jose? Yeah, related to the SOQs. Yes. Extra like SOQs. So I put a little thing in my email about that. This is where you're like evaluating the class and everything. So um, make sure that you uh, take a little bit of time for it. I, I really like the comments more than anything else. It's not that helpful if I just get this, whatever you bubble in doesn't really do anything for me after all this time. But I like things that you liked or didn't like about the class. I'll give you one example. I almost stopped recording my uh, lectures a couple years ago. Uh, after we came back from COVID, I was gonna just get rid of the laptop thing. And then a bunch of people wrote down, oh my gosh, it was so nice to be able to watch the videos again. So they put uh, that kind of comment down. Um, you know, and if there's things that I could do differently or suggestions, I also like to know that uh, because I probably will teach the class again someday. And uh, I would love to know um, just your general thoughts about everything. So, yeah, if you guys could please do that. They're doing it early this year. Uh, like we're like usually they do it right at the end. And in fact, the last day to fill out an SOP form is on the day after Thanksgiving, <laughs> like anybody's going to be thinking about this at that point. So um, <laughs> if I were you, I would just, I would love it if you would just go like fill it out like tonight or something, just get it over with, just take care of it. It's, it should only take a few minutes. I really will read them very, very closely um, right before I decide what everybody's grade is going to be. No, 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 no just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'll, I'll read them like next semester. <laughs> At some point. <laughs> okay, anything else? Oh, maybe we ought to do a little bit of math today. I don't know. Does it sound like a good idea? Um, yeah, so <laughs> just trying to recap uh, what we were talking about last week. Uh, we kind of finished our conversation about trees. And now we're going to talk a little bit about planar graphs, okay? And then we just kind of got started on this last time. This is a fun topic. I really like this one. Um, if you have a planar graph, what that means is that you can represent it in the plane in such a way that none of its edges cross. And in so doing, you divide the graph into these regions, okay? Now just be careful because, you know, if I have a graph that looks like this, right? If I take, this is K4, right? I don't want you to think of these as regions here because this is not a planar representation yet. So when I'm talking about regions of a graph, I'm talking about relative to a planar representation of it, okay? So you have to have a planar representation of that. Um, Assuming that you have a, a planar representation of your graph, uh, we can talk about the degree of any one of those regions, which is just the number of edges that makes up the boundary of that region. So a triangle would have degree three. A quadrilateral would have degree four. Uh, some kind of a n-gon would have degree n. It's just the number of edges that make up the boundary of the region. And if there's an edge that's sort of sticking into the center, of a region that is possible. We could have we could have something like this, for example, right? If the edge is kind of sitting inside the a, a single region, then it actually counts twice 
twice towards the degree of that region. So this region right here, this inside region, we would have you know, one, two, three, four, five degrees, right? There's five parts to that boundary. <clears throat> okay, so this is just the idea of the, de of the degree of a region. Um, and because each edge, right, contributes to the boundary of two regions, if you were to add up um, all of the degrees of all of the regions, this is kind of like the handshaking theorem again, uh, you would get twice the number of edges, twice the number of edges there. So E, E is the number of edges. I put this notation here, right? N is the number of vertices. E is the number of edges. R is the number of regions as such like that, okay? Um, is everybody okay so far? I just have a quick question. Though. Please. Okay, so when we, when we have a planar graph, what do you mean by like a planar representation? Um, so <laughs> this, this is a, this graph right here, is a planar graph. Right. But to represent it with a planar representation, I have to redraw it so that none of its edges are crossing. So then that, that comes to the question if, if it's already like that platform. Like itself, this one? Yeah, it's out, it's a planar representation of itself. Definitely. Yeah, then this is already a planar representation. Oh, okay. Yeah, then, then there's nothing you need to do to it to, to get it expressed as a planar graph. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions so far here? I have one typo on the board. This is not theorem 13.2.1, it's theorem 12.2.1. So this, this material is in section, uh, is in chapter 12. So I'm just jumping into section two of chapter 12. I will be going back to section one after our exam. And that's uh, about uh, colorings of graphs. We're gonna cover that um, in December. But the idea here is the Euler's theorem is that if your graph is connected and planar, then if you take the number of regions and you subtract the number of edges and then you add the number of vertices, it always equals two. <laughs> it is actually always going to be equal to two in every situation. So uh, that is a pretty big, pretty big theorem in uh, the theory of planar graphs. I'd actually like to prove it. I'd show you the proof of that. Um, Actually, before I do the proof of Euler's theorem, I might just show you that that theorem is not true if the graph is not connected. So this Euler theorem down here, the Euler theorem does depend on having a connected graph. So this is a, a remark, which we can add for our notes here. Uh, Euler's theorem fails. It fails if G is not connected. And so I think we probably could all uh, play around with this for a minute and come up with an example. But let's imagine that we have this graph here. And this is just an example. I'm going to make a triangle here. And then over here, I'm going to make a square. So this is my graph. It's got seven vertices. It consists of two parts, essentially. Right, so in this case, uh, I see that there are seven vertices. N is seven. And how many edges do I have here? Three edges along the triangle and four edges around the square. That would be four edges, right? And then we can look at how many regions we have. And how many regions are there? One inside the triangle. Two is inside the square, and then there's always the region kind of on the outside of everything. That's also a region. So this is three. Question? Uh, seven. Why did I write four? I said, I said, I'm just checking to see if anybody's awake. I don't think Okay. Yeah, that should be that should be three. I can see my SOQs now. Instead of seven, and he writes four. <laughs> Okay. Um, anyway, so there you go. Now, if we do the, what is it? R minus E plus N for this example, R minus E plus N in this case would be three, right? So it is not satisfying the Euler's formula at all in this case. Um, so you actually can generalize Euler's theorem and instead of R minus E plus N equals two, if you want to take off the connected piece, 
you can still make a theorem out of it. And the way the theorem should read is that R minus E plus N is equal to the number of connected components plus one, as it turns out. So uh, general, I'll just say a general uh, Euler theorem. And when I say general, I mean, even for a non-connected graph, what it would say is uh, if G is planar, then R minus E plus N is equal to one plus the number of connected components. Something like that, right? So in this example, we have two connected components to the graph. It's the triangle and then the square. So one plus two, we would get three on the right-hand side. So that's kind of where that's coming from. Okay, so far so good. Let's do the proof though of the of the original uh, version of the theorem here. So I'm going to do the proof of theorem 12.2.1. And this is a nice uh, proof. Um, what we're actually going to do is uh, first prove this for a tree, okay? So um, assume that G is a tree. So a tree, remember, is just a connected graph that has no cycles. Um, also, there's a unique path between any two vertices in the graph. That's another way to think about it. And the other way of thinking about a tree, which is really what we want to use here, is that the number of edges is n minus one, it's n minus one. So in this case, uh, I'm just gonna say, since G has no cycles, there would only be one region. There's only one region if the graph has only one cycle. Uh, it has no cycles, I'm sorry, there's only one region. Also, uh, we also know that um, by theorem we did this one last week, theorem 11.5.2. The number of edges is always n minus 1 in a tree. Okay, and so if we now uh, take advantage of uh, the values that are on the board already, we can then calculate r minus e plus n. And r is 1, and e is n minus 1. And then we add n to that. And if we do the, uh, the simplification of that, it does equal 2. All right. So we get 2. So r minus e plus n is equal to 2. So this is uh, the proof when we have a tree to begin with. And what I'm going to do now is generalize it to any connected planar graph. OK? So that's going to be the next piece of this. Questions so far? So good? OK, great. So let's just see how we could generalize this. So now let's let G be any connected planar graph. Start with anything here. Um, and let's just assume that uh, G has uh, you know, R regions E edges and n vertices. I'm just going to kind of emphasize that by putting the r, the e, and the n in the notation there. So we know what those values are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this graph, and do you guys remember the concept of a spanning tree? Yeah. We can take a graph and remove some edges and create a spanning tree. That's not a unique uh, subgraph, but it is certainly something we can do. So let's consider a spanning tree Uh, I'm going to call the spanning tree a T for G, okay? And uh, when you do the spanning tree, I'll call it T, and let's think about what its parameters would be. Um, the spanning tree would be something like this. Let's say that there's R prime uh, regions, there's E prime edges, and of course, there are still n vertices. Right? When you remove the edges from the graph, you don't take out, you never remove vertices. 
So the number of vertices in this spanning tree is, is still F. But uh, in the process of doing this, I have been removing edges. In removing those edges, I might actually be changing the number of regions as well, right? So, you know, you can think about that. If I had, if my original graph had, I'm just sketching here for a second. If this was my original graph, right? If this was my original graph, this is obviously not a tree as it stands because there's cycles in it. I could remove this edge right here. <clears throat> and in so doing, I'm also changing how many regions the graph has. Oh, did you notice that, by the way? Did you notice what just happened there? I removed one edge, and I also created one less region by doing that. E went down by one, and R went down by one. If E and R both go down by one, this equation is still balanced the same, right? If I replace R with one less, and E with one less, R minus E plus N stays the same. This is going to be the idea, is that when we pass between a graph and its spanning tree, we always preserve that balance of the R, the E, and the N. Okay, that's going to be the idea. So we're going to write this down, though. Um, so we have our spanning tree. So we already know, we already know that for a tree, our theorem is true. For a tree, our theorem is true. So our theorem is true. So R prime minus E prime plus N, that is already equal to two. Okay. And then I'm just going to write a little, a little paragraph here, uh, which is just uh, to get G from T. So if I have the spanning tree and now I want to, I'm kind of going in reverse now and I'm going to build back up to the graph G from the spanning tree to get G from T, we are now going to add edges. We add edges between existing vertices. So the vertices doesn't change. We leave the vertices the same, but we're going to add edges. So it'd be like, taking this picture and adding this edge back in again between those existing vertices. I'm kind of going in reverse to get back to the graph G from the spanning tree. As I add that edge, I actually split the region into two for the inside part, right? So you actually end up adding um, another region. So let's just say uh, we add edges between existing vertices each time I'll put a semicolon there. Each time this um, increases the number of regions by one. This increases the number of regions by one. It splits one region into two. Okay, it can't do more than that, but it can split one region into two in so doing. And thus, thus, if I look at R prime minus E prime, if I kind of look at the difference, if I was like comparing the regions versus the edges, this is what it was originally for the tree, right? But then if I add another edge, I will also add another region. So this is going to stay balanced all the way along going from T to G, right? And so, when I look at this equation here, if I just replace R prime minus E prime with R minus E, we get exactly the formula. And it's still equal to two. It's still equal to two. We, we would want to make sure that when we're adding the edges back, that we're definitely doing it in a way that will give us the plan representation of it, right? Because if not, then we, would, we could possibly like add more. Reasons. Yeah, let, let's just assume we're not moving the vertices around at all. We started with a graph that was planar. We removed the edges that created the spanning tree. Now we're just literally putting those same edges back in in exactly the same places, right? We're not changing the graph in any any, any other way. Okay. Sometimes these uh, proofs require just like a little bit of a write-up. You know, I, I, I think of the problem on the homework for tonight that says... Uh, if there's a vertex that has degree P in a tree, then that graph has to have at least P pendant vertices. That is totally just a paragraph. It's not really anything that's like chugging and plugging with equations 
or you know doing a very like robust set of uh, citations of theorems or anything like that. It's really just, so just to give you a hint since I'm thinking about it, if I stand on a vertex of degree P, I'm at a subway station that has P different ways I can go out, right? Any one of those ways that I go out, I can just keep going down that particular subway line and I have to reach the end of it eventually. If I don't reach the end of it, then that means I went in a cycle, but a so tree doesn't have a cycle. So you can just say all of that, right? You can just kind of say that, oh, since there's no cycles in the graph, if I follow this uh, subway line uh, and keep entering a, a terminal station and leaving that terminal station and keep entering and leaving and entering and leaving, eventually I can't leave anymore. Right, because otherwise the graph would be infinite or you would have been going in a circle, neither of which is allowed in a tree. So stuff like that is is totally okay. Just as this is kind of uh, written as a couple of sentences. You had your hand up, yeah. Uh, okay, so for this, when we add edges between the existing vertices that creates like a new region. Yeah, like this, this was one region. And as soon as I added that edge, it split it into two regions. What if it's like the triangle where the, there's something in the, like a vertice in the middle? Like, um, let's see if I can draw it. Like, so you have something like, yeah, this. yeah. Okay. Because if you add an edge, right, it doesn't really add a region. Well, this isn't a spanning tree right now. It has to be oh, connected okay. to begin with. So I would have to have this vertex connected already somehow to what's already there. It has to be a connected graph. And now from here, I could say I'm going to now add another edge because this is connected. <laughs> so I'm okay with taking something connected and then adding another edge in there. And sure enough, that's going to create a second region inside that triangle, okay. whereas there was only one before. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I mean, some of these things take a little bit of thought. Doesn't mean that it requires like a page long, like write up in a proof, but it's good to, to think those. <laughs> yeah, okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so I think that that is the proof. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Oh, now we get to the really fun stuff. You probably have this intuition that if a graph is going to be planar, it should not have too many edges. The more edges a graph has, the harder it's going to be to avoid having them cross each other, right? That's why you know, some people don't like to live in Southern California because there's too many highways and they have to cross each other, which means that you get stuck in traffic. Um, you would rather live in a place where the highways uh, form a planar uh, dispersal, and that would be like where I grew up in Nebraska. You don't have any any need for those things. You also don't like to have crossing edges because it costs a million dollars, probably a billion dollars every time you build a bridge. So you'd rather not have to do that. So here is a really nice fact. The book does not actually state this as the theory, um, but I wish that they would have, and it's certainly in there, but it's kind of buried in the text. I will therefore just call it a fact but it is a really helpful fact, which is the following. If G is a connected planar graph, all right, with, uh, we need to have at least two edges for this to really make sense. I'm gonna just say E greater than one. So the number of edges is, is uh, at least two, at least two edges, uh, then, E is less than or equal to 3n minus 6. Okay. So, you know, as a, you don't need to write this down, but, you know, if I only had this graph, this is connected, this is planar, E is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, so 3n minus 6 would be 0. You'd have 1 less than or equal to 0. Well, that's not true. The reason that this graph is not a counterexample is that because we are required to have more than one edge. So if your graph only has one edge, this, this theorem doesn't really work for this picture, okay? Uh, but that's really the only exception here. So for any interesting graph, this is a upper bound on how many edges it can have. The way that this fact gets used is this is how you can prove that a graph is not planar. Because if this edge inequality fails, if there are too many edges, if this edge inequality fails, 
and you happen to know that the graph is already connected, then the thing that must go wrong is that it must not be planar. Because it's hard to prove it directly. It's hard to prove directly that the graph is not planar. Oh, I tried for five hours to redraw the graph without any crossing edges and I couldn't do it. That's not a proof, right? <laughs> so a much better proof is going to be uh, something like citing this. Count how many edges, count how many vertices, and kind of go from there. The proof is super nice. Let me just show this to you. I actually do want you to know this proof. And in the group work that we're going to do, we're going to generalize this a little bit. So it's you'll get some practice with it. Uh, let's go back to this uh, sort of handshaking uh, result from earlier. If we add up the degrees of all the regions, it's twice the number of edges. Okay. And now every region, uh, sorry, yeah, every region will have degree at least three. Okay. Let me say that again. Every region has degree at least three. The only counterexample to that would be with this graph. There's only one region and it has degree two because there's the left side and the right side of that edge. Okay, so that only has, you know, that this picture has a region of degree two, but otherwise every one of these regions is degree three. So the numbers that you're adding up here, they are all at least three. Okay, and how many numbers do you have that you're actually adding up here? Uh, that would be one for each region. That would be little r. So do you, would you guys agree that this is at least three times little r? Mm -hmm. The number of terms is little r, and each of those terms is at least three. Okay, and I just, this is a good place to mention, this is sort of where we're using the fact that E is greater than one. If E was equal to one, like I show here, you would actually not be able to say that every region had degree at least three. So we do need to use that fact right there. Um, okay, so now what I'm gonna do guys, this is super nice. I'm just gonna go back to the Euler theorem again. Two is equal to R minus E plus N. This is just literally a, a plug and chug. This time, I'm going to take the uh, the R value. So this, this one is the Euler formula, the Euler theorem. I'm going to take the R value. And do you see that from this inequality up here, if I solve for R, it would be less than or equal to 2 thirds of E. 2 thirds of E, right? And then minus E <laughs> plus N. And uh, two-thirds of E minus E, that's negative one-third of E plus N. And uh, let's take that uh, thing and multiply it through by three. So the two becomes a six less than or equal to. If I multiply through by three, I get negative E plus three N. Are you seeing how the proof's going to go now? I want to prove that E is less than or equal to 3N minus 6. Looks to me like I'm almost there, right? So E is less than or equal to 3N minus 6. So for any connected planar graph, we would expect uh, that edge bound right there. Of course, the graph has to be connected in order to even apply the Euler formula in this manner. Remember, if the graph's not connected, then we can't say that R minus E plus N is equal to 2. It might be a larger number, okay? That's your whole proof. If you wanted a proof with some uh, inequalities in it, uh, just calculating with uh, the variables here, uh, that's, your, that's your proof. No more wishy-washiness. This one is totally 100% rock solid. Well, I think they're all rock solid. <laughs> okay, um, let me show you just a quick example of how powerful that is really how powerful that is. As an example, guys, here you go. K5 is non-planar. K5. Uh, while I'm at it, let me draw the graph so we can kind of be looking at it a little bit while we're thinking about this. Here's K5. Okay, that's K5 like that. Um, and so I'm going to do a proof now that K5 is non-planar. 
So by way of contradiction, by way of contradiction, if K5 is planar, of course, we know that it's, of course, connected already. And it obviously has more than one edge. So if K5 was planar, then by the fact, by the fact above, we know that the number of edges would be less than or equal to 3n minus 6. That would have to be true if K5 was planar. However, how many edges does this graph actually have? 10, right? There's the star in the center and then the, the pentagon on the outside. That would be 10. And what is uh, the number of vertices? Five. Okay. And if n is five, uh, then 3n minus six. So if n is equal to five, and I start uh, crunching the numbers here, 3n minus six is going to be nine. Right? So E is actually not less than 3n minus 6. And so that's the contradiction, essentially. That's the contradiction. OK. You could also phrase this as a contrapositive proof. You could just say, uh, you know, suppose E um, is, uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, you could just start by counting the edges and the vertices and then just saying that this fails. And since this fails, G is not planar. You could just say it that way as well. Yeah. So K5 is not planar. Now you can try all day to like untangle these edges, <laughs> right? Um, and you might take a look at that. It's kind of an interesting question as well. Um, you know, if you try to redraw this, let me let me go ahead and see what I can do here. Um, you know, I could I could take this edge that's maybe right over here, and I could pull it on the outside, right? And I could take this edge that's right here, and I could maybe pull it also on the outside, and then I have three more edges, which is this one, this one, and this one, right? And as you can see, I still have one crossing edge here, right? And so you're not planar yet, as we've just proved you're not going to be able to do any better than this. This is actually called uh, the crossing number of the graph. It is, what is the fewest number of crossings that you can have? Like the original K5 over here, oh my goodness, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, that's five billion dollars if each bridge costs me a billion dollars, right? Whereas if I am willing to draw my highways like this, I can at least reduce the cost to one billion dollars, right? So the crossing number is sort of, well, what's the best you could do? How close to being planar is the graph? So we could say um, there's one crossing, uh, and I'll just say is the best we can do. And so I'll just say CN of K5 is equal to one. This is this stands for crossing number. This is something I'm actually going to have in the group work as well. Um, so this is the crossing number of the graph. Just what is the fewest number of cross? If I would if I want to prove that the crossing number of a graph is one. If I want to prove that the crossing number of the graph is one, I actually have to do two things. I have to show that it is not zero. And then I actually have to draw the graph so that it only has the one crossing. Right. So you draw the optimal picture. I'm showing, telling you this because you're going to be doing it. Right. Uh, if I want to prove what the crossing number of a graph is, I show a picture of it with that many crosses on it. And then I prove somehow that I could not have done any better than that, right? So uh, that's that's kind of how that works. And I'll try to give you a little bit more um, help with that as we go along. Okay, yeah, let's see. Yeah, why not? Isn't that what I did? <laughs> anything, anything I do surely is gonna be fair game. That's right. Um, okay. Now, um, 
Let's imagine for a second of my time coming along here. I think I'm doing okay. I'm going to talk for maybe 10 more minutes and we'll try the group work. Let's imagine for a second that our graph, not only is it connected, not only is it planar, not only does it have more than one edge, let's imagine that it has no three cycles. In it. For example, a bipartite graph. We learned last week that bipartite graphs can only have cycles of even length. So if, if my graph has no three cycles in it, I'm going to state another fact here. Um, if G is a connected planar graph with E greater than one and no three cycles, then we can actually give an even sharper bound on the number of edges. Namely, the number of edges in this case is going to be less than 2n minus 4. It's less than 2n minus 4. Now, the way you're going to prove that, you guys are going to prove that in the group work. All you have to recognize is that when you have no three cycles, it means you have no triangles. It means you don't have any regions of degree three. So that all of these numbers here that you're adding up, instead of saying that they're all at least three, now they're all at least four, right? If there's no three cycles, then they're all at least four. So if you take this proof and you change this three to a four and you come back in and you do a similar analysis here, you'll prove that one right there. It's a literally the same proof. So I'm just going to say for the proof, uh, C group work number 11. So we'll, we're, we're going to get to this in just a few minutes. But this is the group work. It's just a more or less taking this a proof we just did and kind of trying to generalize it. But the nice thing with this uh, fact, this second fact now, is that we can actually show, so we're here again. I have a bunch of people on Zoom today. Um, we can actually show that the complete bipartite graph K33 is non-planar. All right, um, I'm going to draw that graph for you here. So I have three vertices on top. I have three vertices on the bottom. So let's just draw this graph in its usual rendition. This is sort of how it normally gets uh, drawn. And you can see, uh, kind of looking at that graph, there's tons of crossing edges in there. <laughs> really has gotten easier to erase this as the day's going on. <laughs> this morning, you should have seen me. I was like, I don't even need to go to the gym today. My arms are getting so tired. <laughs> Somehow, by writing on it, it's actually helping it a little bit. Still not great, but... Um, so let's just look at this graph for a minute. Now, this is a bipartite graph. This graph has no three cycles in it, um, you know, because, you know, any, any cycle that you make, you start on ones either on the top or on the bottom, and you go between the two camps. So you can't go an odd number of times and close a cycle. So this graph um, has, let's just say this is, uh, this is connected, obviously. Um, this obviously has more than one edge, and this has no three cycles. So the only thing uh, that is missing from the assumptions here is uh, the planar part. If this graph was planar, then all of the assumptions would be true, and we would conclude that the edges must be less than or equal to 2n minus 4. Let's count the edges here. How many edges does this graph actually have? The way I count edges usually is I just look at the degrees of all the vertices. You add them all up, right? And then divide by 2. So that's 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Divide by 2, that would be 9, right? So there's 9 edges. Sorry, I heard you. <laughs> um, and then what is n? N is six, right? 
So in that case, two, so, oh, we cannot use, well, I'm sorry, I take that back. We can use the inequality over there if we want to, but the problem is if we do three N minus six, um, three N minus six here would be 12. And we would not have a contradiction because E would be less than or equal to three N minus six. That's not a contradiction. However, if we look at two N minus four, <laughs> right, we get eight out of, that, out of this thing, right? Two N minus four is eight. And so what we have here, is that E is not less than or equal to 2N minus 4. All of these other assumptions were true, though, right? The graph is connected. It's got no three cycles. It's got at least one, uh, two edges. So the only thing that could be contradicted here, then, is by the fact, by the fact, uh, K33 is non-planar. That's the only thing we could now conclude uh, is that it has to be not planar at this point, right? That's, that is it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Is that why it's not an if and only if, like, because e, it was less than three and minus six? Yeah, they, these are, unfortunately, these are not if and only if characterizations, right? So just because the edge inequality holds doesn't mean the graph is planar. And this edge inequality does hold for K33, right? There's nine edges and uh, there's 12 here, right? Nine is definitely less than or equal to 12. That is true, but the graph is not planar um, nonetheless. So the converses of these facts are not true, right? Okay. So anyway, um, this makes sense? Oh, uh, by the way, if your graph has no three cycles and no four cycles, <laughs> then you get to put the five here, right? And then you do another calculation, you're going to get another inequality. It's also in the group work. It's an even tighter inequality. I think I did, uh, did that in the group work and then the, on the exam last time I said uh, basically prove a similar fact or no three cycles, four cycles, or five cycles. <laughs> you really just are doing the same proof. You're just changing this number each time. <laughs> and each time you change that number, of course, you get a better inequality. It's just that it doesn't apply to as many graphs in that case, because in that case, um, you, uh, you, know, you obviously don't have that many graphs that have no three cycles and no four cycles and no five cycles, right? And no six cycles. That, it's pretty uncommon. Okay. Um, so we have two great examples of non-planar graphs. I wonder, by the way, I wonder what the crossing number of this graph would be if I tried to redraw it. Um, so the crossing number of K33. It would be an interesting question. Um, what I usually recommend that we do when we have a bipartite graph is that you try to put, um, you know, support, kind of line up one of the camps here. This is maybe the one of the camps. But then with those other two vertices, put one of the vertices underneath and put the other one on top. And now you have one more vertex. So, so. Right, these three vertices, we've just recopied them here, basically. This vertex on the bottom, we just put it on the bottom, and I've moved one of the other vertices up to the top. I'm trying to redraw the graph with as few crossings as I can. Um, and so I have one more vertex to put in that has to connect to all three of these. So maybe I just set it over here on the side, and it has to connect to that vertex and to this vertex, and now here's where we have to make a crossing, right here. I should not have circled this. It's kind of confusing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Does that make more sense? You see there's only one crossing edge. So again, why is this equal to one? There's two parts to this proof. <laughs> the first part is showing that it's not planar. And then that means you cannot draw it with no crossings. And then actually show me the picture that shows me how to do it with one crossing. That convinces me that you can do at least that good, right? But then the first part of the proof shows that you cannot do better. You could not do any better. 
is this going to have the logic goes with this kind of thing? Okay. Um, really quickly, I would love to state one last theorem here, and then we're going to be pretty much done with what we're going to talk about for today uh, yeah. with this uh, thing. This is a big result. This is called a Kuratowski's theorem. Unless, are there any questions so far, though? Um, I, I guess I should make one other comment. Uh, maybe I won't write it down right now, but you probably this is probably just common sense. If you have a graph that has K33 inside of it, or K5 inside of it. Maybe the graph has some additional edges going somewhere else. I don't know. Whatever. But if there's even a subgraph that looks like K5, it's not going to be planar. Right? Or if there's even a subgraph that looks like a K33, it's not going to be planar. Because you can't even draw that part of the graph without any crossings. So how could you draw a larger graph without any crossings? Right, so you're not going to do any uh, better, uh, even if if the graph is containing these as subgraphs. Right, that's really the point. So here is uh, yes, Nicole. Um, I just was trying to recall with yeah, you, you kind of have to get down in the trenches with the graph and say, okay, can I find five vertices that are all connected to all of the other five vertices? And that, that might not always just be staring straight at you. If the graph was complicated enough, it might be hard to just eyeball that. So yeah, you have to be willing to put a little time into that. Yeah, definitely. So I know you all would love to have a if and only if theorem about planar graphs. I'm going to give one to you finally, okay? These are great facts for disproving planar graphs, right? If the edge counts, if the edge inequalities fail, right? If the edge inequalities fail to hold, then your graph is not planar, right? But it doesn't work uh, in the converse direction. This theorem is an if and only if. A graph is non-planar, if and only if, okay, so this is what we were hoping for, a nice theorem that characterizes the planar graphs, or in this case, the non-planar graphs. If and only if it contains a subgraph. Subgraph is just, you know, a graph within the larger graph. So like this picture here contains K5 as a subgraph. Like some of the vertices, some of the edges, right? It contains a subgraph. I know you would like me to say that it contains a subgraph isomorphic to K5 or K33, because those are the two examples of non-planar graphs that we have here. Unfortunately, it's not quite right. I have to tweak it just slightly. And what it's going to say is that it contains a subgraph that is homeomorphic. Oh boy. Good luck explaining that word. Um, homeomorphic to K33 or K5. Um, kind of don't trip over the word homeomorphic for a moment. I The, the spirit of the theorem, the, the spirit of this theorem is really exactly what you would like it to be that in order for a graph uh, to be non-planar, it should either have a K33 in it or a K5 in it. If you see either one of those kind of as subgraphs of your graph, it's game over. Your graph is not planar. We've already proved that both of those graphs are not planar. And if they're sitting as subgraphs of a larger graph, well, then that larger graph is not planar either. That kind of makes sense. This not homeomorphic thing is really just the following idea. Okay, I'll, I'll just give you the, a rough feeling for it. If I go back, let's go back to the K5 graph here. I think that you guys would probably agree with me that if I was to put a vertex there, 
and maybe I put one here and maybe I put a few vertices on the edges that are already there, right? This is not going to change fundamentally the fact that if you tried to <laughs> untangle this graph and have no crossing edges, you wouldn't be able to do it because after all, it's as, those dots are somewhat kind of invisible and you're not even really seeing the dots. So this graph, once I put those dots on there, is basically homeomorphic to K5. We would no longer say that this is K5 because after all, there's now eight vertices. There's lots of uh, vertices of low degree, right? So this graph is not K5 anymore, but certainly its shape and how it's laid out with its edges, right? If, if, if I could somehow untangle those edges, so that there's no crossings, then I would have been able to do that with the original graph, right? Which we know we can't. So this is basically the idea. Do you want me to write down the definition of homeomorphic? Yeah. Um, yeah? Okay, well, we'll blame Amber. <laughs> That's fine. Um, <laughs> blame Amber. I'll write down the definition. It's kind of technical, but uh, if you want to kind of understand what it's really saying, it's just, it's just what I just, Try to expand there on that K5 picture. So <laughs> I keep thinking of homeomorphic. It's homeomorphic. Let's, put, let's just put the definition here, and then this is pretty much going to wrap things up. So I actually have to define another word first, right? So there's something that we call an elementary subdivision. Okay, so you guys are going to hate me for this because there's a fair bit of writing on this definition, but we'll, we'll get there. An elementary subdivision in a graph is obtained by taking an edge. Well, let me write the edge as UV. If you want, you could you can come back to this picture if you're just trying to understand what's really going on. Here's U and V, just two of the, just imagine you have two of the vertices and you have that edge. You take that edge UV and placing a new vertex. It's literally what I just, just showed you on that K5 picture. Placing a new uh, vertex, I'll call it W, along the edge. Okay, so now I'll go back to my picture again. Up here, I just put a new vertex. I call it W right there, okay? Placing a new vertex along that edge um, to replace, what we're doing here, guys, is we're going to replace the edge UV with, as you can see, there's now going to be two different edges, namely UW and WV. Right? So that's all it is. We just put this uh, new vertex here. Now there's no edge from U to V anymore, but we have two new edges, which are UW and WV. That's called an elementary subdivision. And then two graphs, I'll call them G1 and G2 are homeomorphic. Two graphs are homeomorphic. This is not isomorphic, this is homeomorphic. If, if we can get, if we can get from G1 to G2, or from G2 to G1, go either direction, it doesn't matter, uh, by a series, by a series of elementary subdivisions. By a series of elementary subdivisions. <clears throat> That's the idea. It's just like, okay, I'm gonna put a bunch of dots on the edges that are already there and create more vertices. So this graph is homeomorphic to K5. It's not any more planar than K5 was. It's still not planar. But isn't this nice that every non-planar graph is either K5 
or K55, possibly with some dots added on along the edges. It's not an easy theorem. Okay, I'm not proving this one. <laughs> I don't have enough time to prove this one. Right. So we're not going to try to prove it, but it's a nice, I would like you to know this result, uh, but of course, without worrying so much about the proof. Okay. Proof is left to the reader. The proof is left to the reader. Um, exactly. Or, or what I always like to say, <laughs> I'll put it on the exam. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, guys, we have only five minutes. So what I would like you to do with this group work is just try to do problem one. Uh, and you don't even need to use the whiteboard. Just grab uh, a friend to kind of work with and sitting somewhere near you. Just see if you can uh, do problem one with your partners. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have our notes. We have our See if you can uh, do problem one. Okay. So. It's, yeah, it is. Oh, so so there's no three cycles so there could be four cycles so it's at least so we know two e is equal to sum of the streets of r and that's going to be bigger than equal to four it's like not yet and then we still have, know the same thing. Two is still equal to R minus plus N, right? Yes, that's kind of yeah, That's that's the one. R. Jose and, and Kevin, can you guys work on that number one? <laughs> Oh, oh, you're working with those guys. Yeah. Okay. Can you catch Kevin up to speed then? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yes. This is group work number 11, guys. So you'll find it in Canvas. Be sure to look at it. So is R equal to... Where's, I think that's our, oh, they yes, on. but like, so specifically R equals yeah. one over two T, e, and then when you plug it in to this, you get this. Why was it negative at that? Like, we wanted to. So we saw. I'm going to work on it on the board, so you can you get my board work if you need to. But try to do it without the kids' board first. Copy me, Doctor, and that's my problem. Check it off. Two. That's really good. Maybe some of the three. Yeah. Two. Which is five, which is negative three over five. Yeah, where did oh, we multiplied by three. Yeah, so multiply the right two. Yes, or negative e, which is plus one. Yeah, subtract the higher. I was having these as equal sign because we were using two equals R minus two plus one does R equals So why is that why is that all right smart thing? Maybe it's not a big thing. Maybe 
Yeah, yeah, what's it? Um, you won't, but what did you do in that? We did approve. Okay, let's see. So, yeah, so it's pretty easy. What time is it? I'm going to be fine. Yeah, it's one. Oh my God. I have been running since half of the top of the year. I'm going to do it now. Yeah, I'm going to do it now. 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 I'm going to do it now